There are few diseases out there as grisly as Ebola. But how exactly does Ebola work? Where did it come from? Why are its outbreaks so difficult to contain? And is there any hope of getting rid of it once and for all? There's no question about it. Ebola is terrifying. With the potential to kill within a week and a death rate that's been as high as 90%, the specter of this violent disease is still very much at large in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's time to move from a purely reactive strategy when there's an outbreak. We also need to think of primary prevention. I'm Peter Piot and I'm the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I was part of the team that isolated the Ebola virus for the first time. It may surprise you that there are not one, but two exciting experimental vaccines in use in the DRC, and more in the works. But before we get to these promising breakthroughs, we have to dive into the surprising place Ebola may have gotten its start, fruit bats. Uh, the virus is actually um, an accidental virus for us humans, uh, because it's a virus that lives happily in some bats. When that virus crosses the species barrier, then the mortality is extremely high. There's a couple different patterns that occur. One is that someone hunts an animal that is, is infected with the virus and they catch it because they're exposed to the blood or body fluids or they're preparing the food that was caught. Hi, my name is John Masasi. I am a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the National Institute of Health Vaccine Research Center. Um, I've been working on Ebola since 2005. The family of viruses Ebola um, is part of is the filovirus family, which in uh, Latin means string-like viruses. They are long and filamentous. They can be up to a, a micron in length, so it's quite, quite big for a, a virus. When a person contracts Ebola, typically through contact with the blood or other bodily fluids of an infected person, the virus begins to wreak havoc in every area of their body. But at first, it may not present any signs at all. There's the hot zone and outbreak version of Ebola, which tends to be very uh, dramatized. And the, the, the reality is that that is the, the least common uh, presentation for Ebola. So with Ebola, we're thinking about four stages of infection. The first is an incubation period where you've been exposed to the virus, but you haven't yet uh, shown signs or symptoms of illness. And that can last anywhere from four to 21 days. The second stage of the disease progresses with symptoms like fever and muscle aches, making it difficult to distinguish from other flu-like illnesses. The telltale signs of Ebola don't typically appear until the third stage, about three to six days after these symptoms begin. People start having fluid losses like diarrhea and vomiting. One of the classic things is a rash that you can see on their body, and that's one of the, the clues that we can get that perhaps this is a hemorrhagic fever or uh, Ebola virus. This happens because Ebola infects dendritic cells and macrophages, overloading the immune system like a lightning storm frying an electrical grid. You just have an overall, what we call a cytokine storm. Basically, your immune cells release signals that turn on inflammation, and so you have a giant inflammatory response. Cells will put out a flag that says, hey, I'm infected, come and you know kill me. And Ebola stops both the signal from being sent as well as the signal from being received. The virus can hide in places in the body that are difficult to reach by antibodies, uh, and that is in the, the eye fluid, it's in the, in the testes, and also probably in the brain. The virus can also affect the liver, the adrenal gland, and the gastrointestinal tract. But its most dangerous invasion is into the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. The net reaction to that is that fluid that's in your blood leaks out into the tissues. Your body basically is dehydrated in the blood vessels. And so we, when that happens, we call it shock and patients die of hypovolemic shock. And that progression can happen in a matter of days. The final stage of the disease is its most severe, when patients have lost a dangerous amount of blood and fluids into their tissues and experience a huge range of symptoms depending on which organs the virus has reached. If you are fortunate enough to survive, you have a recovery phase as well. While some patients do make it to that phase, as of the current outbreak, only 66% will survive. But now, owing to some promising trials in Eastern Congo, experts are excited about two new drug therapies that could potentially reduce Ebola's mortality rate by as much as two thirds. One is monoclonal antibody MAB114, a single antibody isolated from a survivor of an outbreak in the 1990s. And another one is a, a Regeneron EB3, that's a, um, a, you know, a therapeutic that also was shown to, uh, to be effective. But treatment is only half the battle. 
Ebola outbreaks have become progressively harder to contain as they approach urban areas. And due to its disproportionate effect on healthcare workers, the ripple effects of the disease have been devastating. This makes finding preventative measures a key priority. To achieve that, two experimental vaccines are currently in use in the DRC, based on their success in previous outbreaks and phase two clinical trials. The first one is the life attenuated vaccine uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, RVSV. That vaccine has now been used well over 250,000 people in DRC. When you give it to the contacts of someone with Ebola, the protection was close to 100%. That vaccine, known as RVSV Zibov or Urbivo, was shown in field tests to be 97.5% protective against Ebola. A second vaccine is produced by Johnson & Johnson, and that is a vaccine made of two doses. One is a killed Adeno-26 virus, and that has the uh, Ebola antigen, and uh, with a second injection of an MVA vaccine that uh, contains multiple antigens, various Ebola strains, and also Marburg. And that's just one of a handful of experimental vaccines in various trial phases. The Urbivo vaccine, recently approved by both US and European governments, is currently being used in what's known as a ring vaccination strategy. Essentially, vaccinating everyone who may have come into contact with an Ebola patient. Ring vaccination was used to eradicate smallpox, and later, along with strong public health efforts, helped to finally get the 2014 to 2016 outbreak in West Africa under control. Alongside the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is being used in a targeted geographic vaccination strategy to protect villages or regions at risk, these vaccines are proving remarkably effective in the DRC and along its borders, and will be the go-to methods as we apply what we've learned so far to similar outbreaks in the future. Governments came together and formed large Ebola treatment units to be able to handle the patients that were coming in and try various treatment regimens so that we could uh, try to determine what might be more optimal care. But whether developing protections or advancing cures, the keys to containing future outbreaks lie in cooperation, preparation, and putting resources in the hands of local communities. When I look at the future of Ebola, is the first thing is that we need much better uh, preparedness, and that means investing in the vulnerable countries, better laboratory infrastructure, regular surveillance of uh, suspect cases, and also possibility for deployment. Make sure that the vaccines are licensed and are available and accessible and affordable. When you deal with epidemics, time is of the essence. And for me, it's a lesson also that if we invest in the science, if we invest in the development for uh, these epidemic diseases, we can do it.